My name is uh, Jason Ray Carney. I am a senior lecturer in uh, popular literature and the history of uh, literary criticism at uh, Christopher Newport University in uh, Newport News, um, Virginia. And I'm just going to be moderating. Um, this is pretty uh, traditional structure for an academic symposium. Um, three presentations, uh, 15 minutes each, um, and uh, that will leave 15 uh, minutes of Q&A. And you know, I, I encourage you guys to uh, ask, ask questions of our, of our presenters. Um, very briefly, I'd like to just uh, introduce our uh, presenters. Um, I have a script because if I don't, then I won't make any sense. So <laughs> maybe, uh, let's see. Okay. So here we go. Our uh, first presenter is uh, Dr. Uh, Dirk Gunther, uh, professor of English literature at uh, Gakushin Women's College in Tokyo. Um, he earned his uh, PhD from Hiroshima University with his dissertation, History, and Robert E. Howard's Fantastic Stories uh, from an Age Undreamed of to the Era of the Old West and Texas Frontier. Um, his presentation is titled, uh, Through the Eyes of an Ophirian Woman, Thoughts Concerning the Racism of Robert E. Howard's The Veil of Lost uh, Women. And our second presenter is uh, Brian Murphy, who um, is not a professional humanist scholar, but if anyone should have a PhD in sword and sorcery, I hereby declare that Brian Murphy does, uh, Brian Mur Murphy should. Uh, Murphy has written a variety of essays and articles for um, The Sumerian, um, Blackgate, uh, Tales from the Magician's Skull, Mythprint, uh, The Dark Man, uh, DMR, Blog, Skelos, SS, SFF Audio. Um, he is also the uh, two-time REH Foundation winner for the Atlantean, uh, Outstanding Achievement in Book, and um, uh, his uh, presentation is titled uh, Far Countries of the Mind, the Frontier Fantasy of Robert E. Howard. And then uh, finally, um, Dr. Will Oliver is a professor of criminal justice at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas, specializing in crime policy, policing, and historical analysis. Um, a lifelong fan of Robert E. Howard since attending his first Howard Days in uh, 2018, he has been writing for the Robert E. Howard United Press Association, The Dark Man, and others, and is currently working on his own uh, Howard biography. His presentation is titled uh, Robert E. Howard, and oil uh, and uh, uh, Robert E. Howard and oil booms, crime, disorder, and reality. Thank you very much for participating in the symposium. And we'll begin with uh, Dr. Gunter. Okay, thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay, thanks for being here. And okay, uh, I'm totally jet lagged, so uh, bear with my really crappy pronunciation. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome and uh, three eyes of an Ophirian woman thoughts concerning a racism in the veil of the lost women. So, I mean, if there's one way uh, during a discussion about the merits of Robert E. Howard's work to bring even the most fervent Howard fan to the defense, then it's the kick in the groin argument, Howard was a racist and his stories promote racism. Um, now, uh, in the next few minutes, by using the example of the veil of the lost women, I'd like to show you a way how to counter such criticism and what I'm suggesting might actually even, or should actually even work with other controversial Howard stories such as Black Cannon. The Whale of the Lost Women is the story that is often regarded as Howard's worst story, or worst Conan story, which is kind of surprising considering the existence of a uh, black stranger or uh, uh, Xuthal of the Dusk. Set in Kush, uh, Proto-Africa, in Howard's fictive Hyborian age, the story is about the young woman, Olivia, uh, Livia, not Olivia, Livia, who, together with her brother, was abducted by black tribesmen. Livia's brother is murdered, and Livia is waiting for her fate, which, as Howard hardly bothers to hide, will include possible ra possibly being raped by the tribe's leader. So when Conan arrives on the scene, Livia offers him a bargain for her rescue, which the Chimerian immediately accepts. So now, one word of uh, warning. The following presentation will not be about whether the Veil of the Lost Women is or isn't the worst Conan story. Um, so we can fight this out uh, at the pavilion after the presentation. <laughs> so uh, I want to focus on uh, the supposedly racist aspect of the story, the depiction of the black tribesmen in the worst possible terms, which turn the Veil of the Lost Women into a convenient tool for those critics who accuse Howard of being a racist and who claim his work promotes racism. So I want to demonstrate um, that such an accusation is not quite correct, as it ignores several essential aspects of Howard's 
writing that are not simply a trademark of Howard's work, but in fact the reason that Howard's stories are even nowadays so highly popular, while other contemporary pulp writers have long been forgotten. And with this having been said, let's go to the Veil of the Lost Women. So if you look at the description of the leader of the tribe who abducted Livia, this certainly gives the faction believing Howard to have been a frothing racist of the worst kind right. Oops, so I'm quoting. On ivory stool, flanked by giants in bloomed headpieces and leopard skin girdles, sat a fat, squat shape, abysmal, repulsive, a toad-like chunk of blackness, reeking of the dank, rotting jungle and the nighted swamps. The creature's pudgy hands rested on the sleek arc of his belly. His nape was a roll of fat that seemed to thrust his bullet head forward. His eyes gleamed in the firelight like li live coals in a dead black stump. The appalling vitality belied the inert suggestion of the gross body. Uh, quote from uh, the story. So, yep, obviously um, there's no other way than putting or then to put it then admitting the fact that out of context and taking at face value that this depiction is brimming with the worst possible racist stereotypes when it comes to, this, to describing African Americans. Certainly no excuse at all. This was also the racism that in the early 20th century was socially accepted in the American society as well as in the rest of the world too. Hey, I'm from Germany, I should know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, now, yes, that <laughs> <laughs> I love that backup. <laughs> so, uh, so now in order to put this passage and similarly racist ones uh, found in the Veil of the Lost Women into a context that allows a more differentiated understanding than just outrage and indignation, I'd like to have a look at how it's background. So by now, it's, I guess, a pretty well-known fact that Howard was a proud Texan who loved his native Lone Star State, its traditions and history. Moreover, Howard was a true expert of the history of Texas. This becomes obvious uh, when, he looks, uh, when one looks at his communication with fellow Via Tales writer H.P. Lovecraft, in which Howard uh, told Lovecraft about the violent history of Texas, and one such chapter of Texas history were the abductions of white settlers by Native Americans, especially the Comanches of the South. Howard addressed this topic, telling Lovecraft of Cynthia Ann Parker, a young woman who, after having been abducted by Comanche, was then ad adopted by the tribe, and later, years later, was rescued against her will by the army. Cynthia Ann Parker was only one of many pioneers, women as well as men who suffered uh, fate, the fate of being abducted by Native Americans. And like Cynthia and Parker, some abductees were adopted by the tribes that had taken them and turned into Native Americans. Other abductees managed to escape or were freed. And some of these freed abductees then wrote reports of the experiences during their captivity, describing the ordeal in, by that time, shocking uh, details, and at the same time, leaving out truths that were generally known but publicly not spoken about, such as having been raped or having had uh, consensual relationships with one of their abductors. And such reports actually found quite an eager readership in the civilized parts, okay, nothing against Texas here, uh, uh, in the civilized parts of the United States and became popular, a popular literary uh, genre called captivity tales. And Establishing now a connection to Howard's The Veil of the Lost Women, considering Howard's knowledge of Texas history and his background as a writer of adventure fiction, I would say it's indeed possible to regard The Veil of the Lost Women as a Hyborian Age captivity tale, with the proto-African tribe featured in the story being the Hyborian Age alter ego of the Comanches of the Texas frontier. And consequently, the, dam the story's damsel in distress, Livia, takes on the role of an abducted settler or pioneer woman. Now things become quite interesting if we analyze the Veil of the Lost Women with tools provided by literature studies. So if we look at who is telling the story, the Veil of the Lost Women, we find that Howard chose a rather unexpected narrative voice. The events of the story are not told by Conan or a godlike omniscient narrator, but instead exclusively through the eyes of Livia, the abducted woman. Howard used here a narrative voice 
which literature calls uh, third per person restricted. This means the story is being told from the third person point of view of one character featured in the story. All the perceptions and emotions presented in the story are the subject subjective emotions and perception of this one single character. All the action that happens in the story is described, seen, and understood from the restricted perspective of this one character who can't read the minds of other characters appearing. In case of the Whale of the Lost Women, this means that Howard presents the events through the distraught and frightened view of a young abducted woman who is not sure of her fate, a young woman who hailed from civilization, Ophir, and who finds herself in the heart of a region that is far away from any civilization, a young woman who had been abducted by people whom she, due to her background, can only regard them as savages or worse. Now adding to Livia's fear-distorted view is the fact that the Kushites killed her brother in front of her eyes. And as if this wasn't already enough, Howard insinuates at the beginning of the story that Livia may actually have already been raped by the tribesmen, which would perhaps even explain why Livia was not hesitating about offering this sexual favor to Conan for, her, for his help. Now, before we fully explore the implication of this narrating voice further, I'd also like to talk about another aspect of Howard's work as a writer. One reason for the intensity and popularity of Howard's writing is his trademark to fully go into the character featured in his stories. When Howard wrote Co uh, Conan's story, then he turned into the barbarian who took over P Howard's personal views and criticism of the depravity of civilization. Howard also became Cull, the brooding, despised outsider at the court of Volusia, who mirrored Howard's self-image of being the despised community pariah of Cross Plains, Texas. Consequently, in The Veil vale of the Lost Women, Howard became Livia, the Ophirian captive of the tribe of the black tribesmen. With Livia's character, Howard reimagined the possible fears and other emotions of a white captive among the natives of the Hyborian Age or the Comanche of the old Texas frontier. One can even go so far to consider Howard's depiction of Livia's thoughts, fears, and her view of her abductors as Howard working like a method actor who immersed himself fully in the character he depicted or performed as. Consequently, Howard's depiction of Livia's abductors resulted in the depiction that, when read with the eyes of a 21st the century reader, is outright racist and, in fact, cannot be else. Such racist de descriptions should not be misunderstood, though, as Howard displaying Livia via Livia's character, his racism, or promoting white supremacy ideas. In fact, Howard presents the thoughts and emotions of Livia in his attempt to lend even the simple, a simple fantasy story, a grim, gritty realism and authenticity. To this means, Howard mercilessly showcases Livia's disgust and resp repulsion of her abductors. And Howard did so by choosing a tone that he regarded as realistically depicting the fear, disgust, helplessness of the captured young woman. And to be honest, it is indeed hard to imagine that in real life, in the real world, a person who has been abducted and abused by her captors would have kind, forgiving thoughts and feelings formulated in pleasing, politically correct prose. On this background, I do not regard it as a surprise that Livia's fear distorted view of her captors fully dehumanizes them and depicts them as bloodthirsty demons, apes, or savages. Now, in order to convincingly describe Livia's thoughts in a realistic as possible manner, Howard had no other way than to depict Livia's thoughts and view of things with drastic terms and images which are neither politically correct nor can't be regarded as else than offensive and racist. This, though, does not allow the conclusion that Livia's thoughts reflect Howard's personal line of thinking or that this displays, displays Howard's personal possible racism. It is, to re repeat again, a method, method acting Howard in an effort to create by, a by then never before seen gritty realism in fantastic literature whose echoes can be found nowadays, for example, in George Martin's A Song of Fire and Ice series, where appearing characters often express disturbing thoughts that fit to the bleakness of Martin's fantasy world. And as far as I'm informed so far, Nobody has accused George Martin of being a sexual deviant 
after having read the lines that Martin let Ramsey Bolton say when he sexually humiliates his wife and captives. Am I still in time? Oh, oh perfect. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, so, so coming back to Howard. Uh, Black Cannon is another story which is often regarded as promoting racism. What none of the critics seem to have noticed is that the pro protagonist of the story is in fact a violent racist, and hereby the story is being told from the point of view and with the voice of such a racist. Here we have again another example of Howard's intensive method acting storytelling. And I'd actually love to elab elaborate on this one, but I have to stop here due to uh, the time restriction, but feel free to catch me after the symposium to chat about this or to knock me on the head. Um, <laughs> coming to the end of this presentation, it's actually quite a tempting thought that Howard may have originally developed The Veil of the Lost Women as a kind of a Western story that tells the tale of a white woman captured by Native Americans from such an abducted po woman's point of view. But then Howard gave up on this idea. And unfortunately, the, uh, there is no draft or letter by Howard available that would support such a theory. So in conclusion, uh, with this short presentation, I'm not trying to absolve Robert E. Howard from having had thoughts or beliefs that are nowadays regarded as racist. So Howard lived in a time and place where racism was alive, regarded as normal and socially accepted, and he was the product of such a time. But that's a different issue. I also do not intend to try uh, to apologize racist passages that can be found elsewhere in Howard's work. But what I want to show is uh, that not every supposedly racist <coughs> passage in Howard's work is actually racist, uh, and that it is actually worth giving a closer look at who in Howard's stories narrates the events. And thinking about it, with this look at the narrating voice, we may even have found the reason why so many people hate the Veil of the Lost Women. It is actually not so much a Conan story, but a story of a young woman during the Hyborian age and that might perhaps settle some issues. Anyway, thank you very much for having suffered for me. Okay. Am I going to proceed? Are we going to take questions now? Uh, no, no. We'll, we'll, we'll no. Your ah, okay. Your All right. I guess I'm going to bring it up. Are you okay if I wave you at 12 minutes? Absolutely. Yeah. I'll, I'll take 12 minutes. <coughs> this thing on? All right. Well, before I get started, I just have to say this. So this is my first Howard days, and I'm, I'm like overwhelmed and blown away. <laughs> it's been wonderful. I just got, came out of the Howard house for the first time, and uh, I feel like I've uh, I don't know, been through a shrine and, and seen, seen the promised land. It, it, but it's, it's amazing just to see the, the wonderful culture here, the, 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 the love for one another, the amazing ideas shared, um, fellowship. I, I will not be my last. Someone's already, Mark already asked me. Uh, mm. yeah. See you next year. Once you come here, yeah. <laughs> we'll see you here next year. So. <laughs> but thank you for having me out and putting me on the spot for my very first hour days as well. But I'm here to talk, uh, well, the title of my essay is Far Countries of the Mind, the Frontier Fantasy of Robert E. Howard. So when, when Jason asked me to present a paper at the Glenn Lord Symposium, I wanted to do something that would be both uh, on point uh, with the man of the hour, Mr. Robert E. Howard, but also uh, spoke as to why we need to seek out new experiences and new landscapes ourselves. So this is, uh, as I just mentioned, my first trip to Cross Plains, a, a very far country, at least to the son of Massachusetts. <laughs> so I'll start with a question. Any, any Jack London fans in the house? All right. There's at least as many hands up as, as down, so that's good. Howard certainly <coughs> was. Uh, he referred to London as this Texan's favorite writer, and he boasted that London stands head and shoulders above all other American writers. We probably know London today, uh, best known for his novels Call of the Wild, White Fang, and the Sea Wolf, and short stories like To Build a Fire. Um, London actually did write some notable fantasy, including a book which held Howard in a particular possession and spell, uh, the Star Rover. Um, but compared to Howard, London's literary corpus was principally set here in a recognizable historical framework of contemporary times, uh, the Klondike and the South China Sea. So why is that? Well, born in 1876, three decades before Howard, London was 
able to experience life in a way that Howard could not. Uh, London had a literal frontier in which to set his stories, the Klondike, which is a Yukon territory up in Northwest Canada. Uh, London experienced North America's last frontier firsthand. In 1897, a 21-year-old Jack London took part in the gold rush in search of fame and fortune. His adventures in this vast, unforgiving, awe-inspiring expanse of wilderness formed the remainder of his writing career, and it was something akin to magic. Um, in the last chapter of The Call of the Wild, The Sounding of the Call, John Thornton, Buck, and their companions embark on a long overland voyage in search of a lost mine, pushing the boundaries of the gold rush into uncharted lands. And I, I love this patch, as I'm going to share it in a moment, but it's, 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 right, it's here as though the characters have left reality and entered the land of myth, a hunt for treasure in a dangerous, unknown, and fantastic world not so far from the likes of Conan, as you might think. Uh, London's language here is heightened, rarefied, almost otherworldly, and I'm going to ask you to indulge me a little reading here uh, from, again, The Call of the Wild. When Buck earned $1,600 in five minutes for John Thornton, he made it possible for his master to pay off certain debts and to journey with his partners into the East after a fabled lost mine, the history of which was as old as the history of the country. Many men had sought it, few had found it, and more than a few there were who had never returned from the quest. The lost mine was steeped in tragedy, and shrouded in mystery. No one knew of the first man. The oldest tradition stopped before it got back to him. From the beginning, there had been an ancient and ramshackle cabin. Dying men had sworn to it, and to the mine, the site of which it marked, clinching their testimony with nuggets that were unlike any known grade of gold in the Northland. But no living man had looted this treasure house, and the dead were dead. Wherefore, John Thornton and Pete and Hans, with Buck and half a dozen other dogs, faced into the east on an unknown trail to achieve where men and dogs, as good of themselves, had failed. They sledded 70 miles up the Yukon, swung to the left into the Stewart River, passed the Mayo and the McQuestan, and held on until the Stewart itself became a streamlet threading the uplanding peaks which marked the backbone of the continent. On this great journey into the east, straight meat was the bill of fare. Ammunition and tools principally made up the load on the sled, and the time card was drawn upon the limitless future. I love that. We weren't, weren't really in holy grail territory here, or perhaps the land of the jewels of Waller, possibly. Um, but. Of, Again, born 30 years after London, Howard lived in a world in which the frontier, at least in the continental U.S., had closed. In 1906, the West was only recently settled, but was settled nonetheless. After Wounded Knee, the days of Indian raids were largely over. In Howard's time, the gold rush was not individuals seeking wealth, but oil companies setting up shop in Texas and pumping the land of black gold, leaving broken bodies and despoiled land in their wake. Faced with this unsatisfying reality, Howard turned to his typewriter, to stories set in a world of fantasy, where a frontier of the mind could still be found. The Hyborian Age is Howard's impossibly ancient recreation of the Western, where the entire world was still a frontier to be explored, great plains and vistas of wild lands to be traveled and settled, forgotten cities and their riches waiting to be discovered and plundered, decadent cities and civilizations ripen for treading under the sandaled feet of barbaric races. It was also a place where life had meaning because it was put to the test. Back to London, in a story of far country, two civilized slackers serving as part of an expedition in the Klondike opt to leave their party and hole up for the worst of the winter in a cabin. They succumb to their own sloth and the dark isolation of the terrible cold north it's dark and terrible and wonderful. And again, I want to indulge with a passage from a far country. When a man journeys into a far country, he must be prepared to forget many of the things he has learned and to acquire such customs as are inherent with existence in the new land. He must abandon the old ideals and the old gods, and oftentimes he must reverse the very codes by which his conduct has hitherto been shaped. To those who have the protean faculty of adaptability, 
The novelty of such change may even be a source of pleasure, but to those who happen to be hardened to the ruts in which they were created, the pressure of the altered environment is unbearable, and they chafe in body and spirit under the new restrictions which they do not understand. This chafing is bound to act and react, producing diverse evils and leading to various misfortunes. It were better for the man who cannot fit himself to the new groove to return to his own country. If he delay too long, he will surely die. This was Howard's model. These lands were hard and broke many, but they were a testing ground where life was vivid and real and you could emerge from it transformed if it did not destroy you. So being of Texas, Howard has always been a Western writer, even if not always recognized as such. According to Glenn Lord, and of course I had to reference him here, uh, Howard wrote 41 re Westerns over his career, all but four prior to 1933. These include weird Westerns like The Hoof Thing, The Black Hound of Death, his humorous Breckenridge Elkin stories, and even pulpy historical fiction like The Vultures of Wapaton, which I just read on the plane ride out here. Uh, his Marches of Valhalla takes place in a prehistoric Texas. Carl Edward Wagner and Echoes of Valor describe Howard's work as a fusion of old world myth and old, worth, old west legend. And of course, Mark Finn has made some mighty inroads with uh, Blood and Thunder. But mostly, he's still known as the Conan guy. <laughs> so another Howard scholar who sought to rectify this narrow view was the late great Steve Tompkins. In How the West Was Wondered, in the April 2005 Sumerian Journal, Tompkins quipped, Robert E. Howard's sense of humor could be plenty dark, and we can but hope that he would have been amused by his status as a perennial absentee, a nowhere man of Texas literature. He has become a figure of world historical significance in modern fantasy without ever figuring in the literary annals of his home state. Tompkins' essay includes a William Carlos Williams citation. So William Carlos Williams described America as perhaps being the only nation capable of flooding the civilized world with rich regenerative violence because of its frontier legacy. And when we see the picks flooding over the walls of Valenzo's stockade at the end of The Black Stranger, we understand. Howard had no contemporary frontier in which to set his stories, tell his stories like London had, but Howard's violent fantasy frontiers regenerated readers' minds that were no longer offered the possibility of somewhere else. The Hyborian age became Howard's far country, a place where he could hurl off the shackles of modern courtesies, conformity, and expectation through larger-than-life figures like Cull and Conan. We need a frontier. I sometimes wonder if our lack of unclaimed land is at the root of our current national and international unrest. At least here in the U.S., we don't do well with restrictions and imposed scarcity. We feel the need for frontiers without, and we feel them within. Howard needed them, something beyond the close walls of his cross plains bedroom, crying out for individual liberty, the only thing worth a damn, as he famously said. The Hyborian Age is Howard's impossibly ancient recreation of the Western, when the entire world was still a frontier to be explored. Great plains and vistas of wild lands to be traveled and settled, forgotten cities and their riches waiting to be discovered and plundered, and decadent cities and civilizations ripe for treading under the sandaled feet of the barbaric races. And beyond the Black River, a small group of settlers struggled to make a living on the edge of the vast, dark, Pictish, Pictish wilderness. And it's essentially a Western masquerading as a weird tale. Consciously or unconsciously, the West crept, the West crept into his fantasy, which lent them much of their unique character. <clears throat> As has been well documented, Howard began to turn away from fantasy and towards stories of the Old West, particularly the history of Texas. He often waxed poetically of these bygone times. In a December 1934 letter to Lovecraft, he relayed a road trip he and good friend Truett Vinson took to the wild and isolated frontier village of Lincoln, home to the infamous and bloody Lincoln County War. Howard described his arrival as stepping into an elder age where old ghosts stalked its dusty haunted streets and of catching a glimpse of the once limitless frontier and the open desert plains west of the Pecos River. In this old town of ghosts, he saw a frontier. Had he lived longer, he would have written those stories. While this assertion, of course, involves some degree of speculation, 
His own words layer that assertion with more than a veneer of truth. I'm gonna offer one final passage from one of Howard's own letters. I love this one too. <laughs> well, they have gone into the night, a vast and silent caravan with their buckskins and their boots, their spurs and their long rifles, their wagons and their mustangs, their wars and their loves, their brutalities and their chivalries. They have gone to join their old rivals, the wolf, the panther and the Indian. And only, and only a crumbling dobe wall, a fading trail, the breath of an old song remain to mark the roads they traveled. But sometimes when the night wind whispers forgotten tales through the mesquite and the chaparral, it's easy to imagine that once again the tall grass bends to the tread of a ghostly caravan, that the breeze bears the jingle of stirrup and bridle chain, and that the spectral campfires are winking far out on the plains. We would have had some amazing Western literature from Howard's typewriter, blending poetic flourishes with realism, possibly tales about Billy the Kid or John Wesley Harden, of whose tales he regaled Lovecraft at length. Maybe something as poignant as Larry McMurtry's Lonesome Dove. And uh, my friend Deuce Richardson reminded me that Howard was a, uh, McMurtry was a Howard fan. Uh, blending virtue and violence and an unflinching look what a cattle drive might actually look like when aid was far away and Indians and cattle rustlers stood in for pigs and Zamorian thieves. Howard's mind was in a far country. Maybe he tarried there too long. Sadly, we don't have this great, his great tale of Texas, but what we do have are his stories of impossibly distant frontier life in a far country beyond the Black River. Thank you. So in my discipline, we always use PowerPoint. It's like mandatory. <laughs> you have to use it. Yep. Oh, for some reason, it's yeah. showing there. We're going to give it a second now. Is there a remote to change the input? It might be a different. So my day job is criminal justice, but since I've been writing on Howard, most of it has not been criminal justice. There's <laughs> only been two. Uh, and the first one, I actually, when I was looking at reading through A Means to Freedom, the exchange between Howard and Lovecraft, I noticed they started debating about police, and they had very different opinions. And so I saw that as data, and I used that for an article about uh, public opinion in the 1930s. And that was published in the Journal of Criminal Justice, uh, Criminal of, Journal of Qualitative Criminal Justice, to be precise. So the other one is this one. So without further ado, Robbie Howard and the Oil Boom Towns, Crime, Disorder, and Reality. So Howard's had a lot of things to say about the boom towns. Probably his most famous quote is this one. Hopefully everybody can read it. Nobody says. You want me to read it to you? Okay. Um, I'll say one thing about an oil boom. It will teach a kid that life's a pretty rotten thing about as quick as anything I can think of. <laughs> he also had a lot of other things to say, and I will not read every one of those that's up there. Okay. But he had an enormous amount of things to say. Glamour and filth, that's an oil boom. Everybody's oil crazy. He talked a lot about it in his letters. And he told Lovecraft, he told Clark Ashton Smith, he told a whole bunch of people all about how bad it was to grow up in an oil boom town. The question I had was what Rusty Burke has brought up a number of times, most recently in David Smith's um, literary biography of Howard. And that is the issue of, Howard is a storyteller. 
So no matter what he gets his hands on, he's going to stretch the truth, he's going to play it up, he's going to deliver it in a way that tells a good story. The truth be damned, right? So my question became is how much of the oil boom stories in his letters is reality and how much of it is him just telling a good story. And we know he does this because of the tall line, the tall tales. Uh, Mark Finn was the first to point out Modi C. Boatwright's essay on tall lying is exactly the kind of writing that Howard does. And not just in the Breckenridge Elkin stories. He does it in a lot of his other stories as well. So is he telling a good yarn? So I wanted to figure out the reality of this. And the question was, is how could I go about doing that? Well, lo and behold, looking on the internet, I discovered that at University of Texas, <clears throat> at the Briscoe Center, they have a collection of narratives. They were interviews of oil workers from the early 20th century. And they had the actual interview tapes as well as transcripts. A couple of them I could listen to on, um, on the internet, but to get the transcripts I needed to go there. So I paid a visit. So this is a qualitative analysis of the oil workers interviews. All of these interviews were conducted between 1952 and 1960. Most of them were in 52 and 53. 96% of these were oil workers. They were roughnecks. Okay. There were 218 interviews. 179 had transcripts. Only a couple of them was because the interview tapes were corrupted. The rest of them were all because the accent of the oil workers was so thick None of the transcribers <laughs> could figure out what they were saying. I listened to a couple of them, and I agree. There's no way you would have gotten that. So then what I did is I took Robert E. Howard's letters, and I looked for phrases and certain words that he used that would indicate what made the oil boom town so bad. All right? And then I took these, and I searched through. Unfortunately, there was also an index. And I found 86 interviews mentioned some of the same things that Howard did. I went through, read them all. 34 of these were excluded because they were just mentions. Like, yes, crime was a problem. Well, that doesn't tell us a lot. So I got rid of those. So in the end, I ended up using 52 interviews. And these are some of the phrases that Howard had. Everybody's oil crazy, oil boom towns, booze dens, dope peddlers, gambling joints, dance halls and whorehouses, knocked in the head, gunshot wounds. It's a wonder somebody didn't kill him. <laughs> Drunken roughnecks. There were several fights, stabbings, bleeding and dying from machinery accidents. I thought I'd throw that one in there. <laughs> so let me give you an example of what I found. So everybody's oil crazy. Uh, Howard sentiment was a common thing among all 52 of them. Everyone said, yep, they were crazy towns. Uh, Nichols, who worked in many of the oil fields, including those around Beaumont, had this to say. He said, I've since been through many oil boom towns, but during the heyday of Beaumont, it was undoubtedly the most congested places I have ever seen. Attempt, if you may, to visualize a little town of about 9,000 population, trying to absorb 50,000 uninvited guests. Lawlessness and hijacking became rampant. Nearly all 52 of these had things to say along this line. Um, the, uh, most of them talked about a floating population that would follow the oil boom. So there'd be an oil boom, the oil workers would come in, and right behind them was the floating population, which included all of the people that were setting up the bars, the saloons, uh, the dope, selling the dope, the whores, and things like that. Um, the people in Batson at the time apparently came come up from all over the United States. And they was gamblers, whores, and the very lowest class of people that you could think of. Another one, they follow up those booms, you see, and they have different methods of making money and swindling and selling liquor and hijacking and gambling. <coughs> Just anything to make an easy dollar, you see. Donahue echoed this as well from the Batson oil field near Houston. You know, lots of amusing things happen down here in Ranger. Sorry, this is actually the one from Ranger. I got these two reversed. Um, so this one's a little closer to home to Howard. Okay, so just north, uh, northeast of here was the Ranger oil fields. And so he says a very similar thing. You know, lots of amusing things happened down there at Ranger during the height of the boom. So many people were there and the congestion in every direction. There was lots of crime too, 
murders, kidnappings, hijacking, and this, that, and the other. What do they mean by hijacking? In this case, it could either be, most of it was when they get to knocked in the head, that's what they were talking about. Sometimes they would set up on the sides of the road, sometimes they would go into the house, but hijackings tended to mean, you know, robbery is what we would call it. Howard also talked about that there were several fights. Um, here's another one, Howard's statement, that was well supported by almost all of them. Um, one man by the name of Dean said that there was lots of drinking and lots of fights. And if there was anyone who could confirm this, it would be law enforcement. So William Cotton of the Batson, who was a Batson deputy sheriff, free-for-all fights and just a general melee was what every man or every officer of a city like this was at the time of 10,000 people might have to contend with. A lot of them talked about that they, these were just you know, open brawls, not just one or two having a personal grudge, but I mean open brawls. It may start as a personal grudge, but then it would go to everybody in town. The, the roughneckers love to fight. Um, H.P. Nichols was another one. Um, he said all roughnecks have fights, but then he recalled one of his own. The qualification of an early day driller was determined by the amount of liquor he could waddle around with and the number of fist fights he could win. My nose has been broken numerous times, and for several years I carried the distinctive mark of a willing but losing gladiator. A pair of black eyes and my eyeballs usually resemble chunks of raw meat. <laughs> Howard wasn't kidding. The other thing I found interesting was that this wasn't always limited to the roughneck oil workers, right? The roughnecks. Um, this actually included other people outside of that. Apparently everybody loved to fight. So here's one quote from Bill Bryan. I believe Nella Dale and Grace Ashley put on the best bout I have ever seen. I think they fought an hour and 15 minutes before they were separated. And when they quit fighting, they didn't have on enough clothes to wipe out a 22 rifle. <laughs> Knocked in the head was another one that was important to me. Um, and for a reason I'll get to here in a second. Um, this was, again, the hijackings, the robberies. All right? Um, so before I get to it, I want to give some context to this. I don't necessarily want to read all of this, but this is a quote from E. Hoffman Price. If you remember, there was a point where um, E. Hoffman Price and his wife, Howard was driving them around and showing them um, the town and the sights and everything, and all of a sudden he stops at one big branch, bramble, bush, whatever, and he stops, pulls out the gun from his glove compartment, kind of looks over there, puts it back, drives on. And the prices were like really confused, like what the heck is he doing? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, sometimes you gotta be careful. People have enemies around here. And I always thought, man, okay, if there's anything that would say maybe he was a little crazy, this might be it. So, Novel and Price had a similar story, kind of, and maybe gives a little explanation to why this was the case. And she talked about that they had gone down the road, they were driving, and there was somebody on the side of the road working on a, um, uh, you know, changing a tire, and uh, Howard just blasted on by them. And she's like, why didn't you stop? And he said, you have to be careful in this country. You never know when you see a car like that, whether it's someone needing help or someone ready to hold you up and take your life and your money. So when I started looking in the oil, I was really interested in these particular, if there was anything along these lines, Sure enough, there were quite a few, but J.T. Cotton Young, uh, an oil worker, said it probably best. I'm coming through the East Texas field and they tried to hold me up one time, just before daylight. A fella run out and flagged us, you know, tried to flag us. We just drove right on, but it wasn't a hundred yards till another and jumped right out, see? And I said, hit that son of a bitch, Bill, hit him. And he got out of the way. See, you could tell, this one that was here, he thought I'd stop and the other one would run up. And then they would knock him in the head. They were always knocking everybody in the head back. And apparently <laughs> that was the way you, you did it. Um, there were people that, that talked about going into people's tents on payday, right? And they would just knock them in the head and steal their money. I mean, literally knock them out. So when I listen to old time radio and they're always knocking people out and the detectives always getting knocked out, and now I know why. <laughs> 
And again, uh, one from Batson. So Howard was just not exaggerating. Uh, one morning there at Batson, they picked up five fellas that was killed that night. So this is the consequences <coughs> of getting knocked in the head. There's a laying there around different places, you know. Some fella knocked him in the head. At Sour Lake, it was not uncommon to go down in the morning, any morning, and go down there through the oil fields and find somebody that had been hijacked and knocked in the head. And it was the same at Spindletop and Humble. So this one knew because he had worked in multiple of the oil boom towns. So again, uh, a lot of support for what Howard was saying. Another one is gunshot wounds, right? Now we're getting more serious. Howard mentions them, and so did many of the workers. Rathke may have been engaging in some hyperbole, and Howard did uh, often, but when he told the interviewer, you could look down that street any time of night, I believe you wanted to, and you could see gunfire. Somebody shooting, and, so and shooting somebody too. But this may have been also because he recalled this. I went to work one morning, got breakfast, and went to work one morning, and I heard some shooting when I first woke up. There was four men laying out there, just about 300 feet from where I ate my breakfast, where they had been shot. Blood was running along down just like a stuck hog. You know, down, down the ground there? <laughs> These are verbatim, by the way. Perhaps the best person that would know about gunshot wounds would be obviously a country doctor. And just like Dr. Howard, who often was called to the oil fields to you know, patch up somebody that was either you know, bleeding, wounded, what have you, or sick. Um, Nichols was a physician in the oil field. And he said one time there was quite a great deal of shooting here. The, some of the saloons where the men were killed, dances, some of the policemen got in, some of the deputy sheriffs got in, shooting at each other and those things. So again, this was highly common. Um, he also recalled one personal incident. This is Nichols again. One nervous man emptied a six-shooter at me from a distance of about 20 feet. Now, why would you shoot at a physician? I have no idea. <laughs> mm. But by the words and everything, again, gunshots, Gunshot wounds seem to be very common. So all 52 confirmed the two passages or the two lines that Howard said. Everybody's oil crazy in the oil boom town. Most of the other ones, there was a majority of them. So in the paper, I don't have every quote, but I have usually two or three to show and demonstrate what, what I was reading. Um, most of them kind of said the same thing, but I always picked the ones that was the most interesting. The least evidence was for dope peddlers. Um, I only found two that even mentioned uh, dope selling. That didn't seem to be as common as, as Howard had said or had made it seem. There was no evidence for stabbing. I guess they were either you know, knocking you in the head or shooting you, so they didn't need to worry about stabbing you. I, I don't know, but um, there was no evidence for that. One additional category, Howard never talked about murder in the oil boom towns. All, a lot of these um, roughnecks talked about it. So apparently murder was very common as well. Now, there's some limitations to the qualitative data, right? You can't generalize Howard's experience because they were his own. You also have the oil roughneck workers, right? You know, the oil field workers, they can only convey what they experience, not what every oil worker experienced. So there's some problems there with that. Also, not all of the oil boom towns are the same, so the ones that Howard experienced are not the same, necessarily the same as the ones that the oil workers experienced. And then, of course, the time issue. Some of these were before Howard's time, before Howard would have been aware. Some of these, uh, some of these, not all, but most of them were during Howard's life, uh, but there were a few afterwards. So again, there's some limitations to, to making these kinds of connections. But in the end, I, you know, I come away. How I love telling a good story, but based on the lived experience of the oil workers included in this study, his depiction of life in an oil boom town, they were rooted in truth. Thank you. So it's uh, 4.24. Do we have time for uh, a few questions? Just ask maybe a couple of questions. Please, Mark. 
I just wanted to uh, comment uh, for Will. Uh, thanks for doing once more of the heavy lifting there. Uh, I found uh, an account in the Cross Plains Review of, of a hijacking incident during the, the time period that uh, Howard was alive. So, so, so there was a specific incident that they reported on. Um, I want to say it was 25 or 26. I, I'll have to go back and look, but I put it in Blood Thunder okay. to prove that Howard wasn't crazy like he often Price thought he was. Was that one that we're you know we're driving along and the tire changing the tire on the yep. side? Okay, it's, okay. It's exactly the setup that he gave Novel. All right, I'll raid your book for that. Yeah. <laughs> the gentleman in the back. By the way, it is three twenty-five. I, that was Virginia time. I'm sorry. On the left, you were talking about. On the left. Okay, that's that's me on the left. Okay, that's okay. Then. Yes. Yeah, I mean, okay, that's, that's actually another uh, point where we can say that um, so when uh, Howard did not actually uh, have these general rate that he used racism uh, as expressing his personal views by, for example, depicting, uh, as he said in, in Solomon Cain, black people actually also as positive. I mean, he had his black sidekick. So yeah, that, does that answer some of your question? I, I, I didn't quite catch it sound-wise. Oh, what, what is the question again? Sorry. <laughs> Yes. You know, they had a very positive relationship. So the, um, like you were saying, that a lot of the attitude towards different people of different races and yeah. how it worked was solely the character attitude and not how it was. Yes. Describing from the character. And this is Solomon Cain and his relationship with Jim Longo, a good example. Mm -hmm. Yes. Agree. Uh, Yes. Really aren't, you know, I don't think that's the worst thing about it. You can read physical descriptions like that in Donald, mm -hmm. I think they're ice, you know, icebergs slim. But the, the, the most racist thing, thing in Stella Lost Women is the bargain that he makes. I mean Conan casually uses black women. He says that thing, you know. And then but he, he really didn't want that black chieftain to have relations with the girl. I mean his main thing was he didn't you know, he didn't want a white woman spoiled by a black man, but he's free and easy. You know, banging black women all the time. That's the racism in the story, not the description. And then, plus, you don't address the lesbian as an anti lesbian thing at the end either. So, I think if you want to make the essay stronger, you know, not that I'm an expert, but you know, <laughs> no, 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 that's actually an excellent point. I mean, it's uh, once again, we are talking about a 15 minutes uh, yeah, presentation. Yeah, I, so, I just, and I mean, but the physical description, I mean, I don't think that's all that bad. No, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, it, yeah, <laughs> let's take that <laughs> out. <laughs> it was a miscegenation of what I admired. Mm -hmm. You see that in his other fiction, just like in the Right. Not Pro that game, that's probably time for one more short question. Okay, Anyone? Any takers? Well, thank you very much for these excellent presentations. Thank you.